Hi, everybody. Uh, uh, thank you guys for attending, and I'll introduce the other panelists and have them come up and join me on stage. Uh, first, we have Dr. Brendan Dwyer, and his information is also in the panel, but give you a background on him. He's an associate professor and director of research and distance learning at the Center for Sport Leadership at Virginia Commonwealth University. Dwyer's research centers around sport consumer behavior with a distinct focus on the media consumption habits of fantasy sports participants. In addition to teaching and research, Dr. Dwyer's worked with a number of sport organizations, including the Fantasy Sports Trade Association. Please welcome Dr. Dwyer to the stage. Uh, our next panelist, Dr. John Grady. Please join me. Dr. Uh, Grady is a social professor in the Department of Sport and Entertainment Management here at the University of South Carolina. He is currently president of the Sports and Recreation Law Association, and his law degree and PhD are from Florida State University. He researches legal issues and sponsorship involving collegiate and Olympic athletes. Please welcome Dr. Grady to stay. And our last panelist is Jimmy Strong Esquire. Uh, Jimmy, please join us. Jimmy is a legal associate and advisor for Baker Donaldson Law Firm. He was a valedictorian of his class at Morehouse College, and he earned his law degree from Harvard Law School. Uh, his extensive knowledge working with daily fantasy sports organizations have afforded him great insight in the gaming industry. Uh, and Jimmy also comes by way of Nashville, Tennessee with me as well. So please welcome Jimmy to the stage. <laughs> All right, we've got the introductions out of the way. Um, so let's, let's begin our discussion. So I guess, um, a lot of us are well informed about uh, daily fantasy sports, but a lot of us are not. And, and can everyone hear me in the back? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, for any reason you can, please signal to one of us to speak up a little bit. Um, but I guess the first thing to do, even though we are well informed, let's talk about kind of where the industry is and, and where it started, where the regulation started. So um, I'm going to pass uh, this question to Dr. Dwyer and just say, can you give us a bit of background? Um, just about fantasy sports in general. Sure. Um, well, thanks for having me here, first of all. And I'm up here with three lawyers, so I'm the least uh, legally knowledge up here. But from a fantasy sports perspective, I can say you know, fantasy sports have been around since the 1950s. Football is probably the most popular. That's what started in the 50s. Baseball is, became the most popular in the 70s and 80s. Um, and it wasn't really until the dawn of the internet and when it was much easier to crunch numbers quicker we saw fantasy sports as an industry explode. Late 1990s through the early part of the 2000s, it took off. And I'm talking more about traditional season-long fantasy sports. Um, in 2006, it got a really important card out, I'm not sure if I'm getting myself or not, but for, um, from a fed at the federal level, saying it's not a form of gambling. That um, while the federal level was trying to get a hold of a growing poker, online poker, online blackjack, online gambling in general industry, um, the NFL, Major League Baseball, uh, NBA, NHL all lobbied to make sure that fantasy sports was not part um, of a gambling industry, so it got carved up. So it was not deemed an illegal form of gambling. After that time, fantasy sports continue to grow. We now see fantasy sports television shows, networks, radio stations associated with it. Um, but then daily fantasy sports came along um, in the last 24 to 36 months, we've seen daily fantasy sports explode. It would be very hard to survive last year's football season and not see one of their advertisements. Um, I think the exact advertisement figure for September and August was 13,000 advertisements just on ESPN alone. So uh, it's grown, the money's grown, it's a huge business, it's a multi billion dollar a year industry, not just traditional season long, but also daily. Um, but now it's come under fire, and that's what we're going to talk about. And so that, and we'll reference that act, that, that act was in 2006? Six, six, 10 years ago. Okay, so uh, in essence, there was a carve out that, that allowed for fantasy sports to be carved out and not considered as gambling. Uh, throughout the course of this conversation, I'm sure we'll touch upon that in great detail, and it'll piggyback on a lot of the things that we discuss. And so, you know, moving on and, and getting to the legal update, there's now uh, pending state legislation my understanding, and uh, if you could, again, I, I'll open this up and, and let Dr. Breyer start off with this discussion, but could you give us a little bit of background on where the legislation is at the state level? 
Yeah, sure. Feel so free for you guys to know a little more about the health is too. Um, but um, there's currently 33 states, I think, that have some sort of law trying to going through, trying to legalize daily fantasy sports. There's a number that have already found it to be an illegal form of gambling. Um, you know, the most notorious or the ones that get the most headlines are the state of Nevada, obviously, you said it's a form of illegal gambling and it needs to be uh, licensed and regulated. New York and Texas are the ones that, because of the size of the states, uh, have also found that it is um, an illegal form of gambling. My great state of Virginia was the first one to say that um, they're going to partner with the industry and regulate it in its legal form. Um, and same with Indiana. Indiana, in the last couple of weeks, has uh, had a, a, a bill passed through their um, legislative, system, legislative system to say that it's a legal form of gambling. Now, there are a number of other bills out there. I think 33 of the 50 states have some sort of bill in the world. Um, as I mentioned, there's five that have um, said that it's either historically, because they just don't like fantasy sports at all in their state, or it's, uh, or it's being contested. So uh, it's still evolving at the state level, and I think it's going to continue to move um, until there's some sort of federal law. John, can you add a little bit more? Yeah, sure. The, can you hear me? The ability to regulate state by state, though, essentially will create 30-some different <coughs> of this law. As we get later on to the technology, because fantasy sports are conducted over the internet, now you have to regulate the people in those states performing this behavior. So the federal solution is the solution. Uh, the problem is it likely will, will be taken up state by state the near term. Uh, if you look at anal analogies to right of publicity law, right, a federal right of publicity is the solution, yet over 29 states have right of publicity law. So again, you're seeing a state-by-state -state approach, which creates essentially a patchwork of laws, which for, from an industry perspective, you now are meeting you know, this, hypothetically 50 different versions of this same goal little minor interests. As Jimmy will point out, the state's interest is their citizens. They don't really care what the neighboring state does or doesn't do. They want to protect or regulate their citizens in this behavior. And, and we'll talk about how that, that sort of patchwork uh, uh, adjustment to you know, whatever issues are out there state by state affects the innovation. You know, and, and I think, and, and we can actually the, word, the, word, the better word is limits, limits the innovation. Yeah, yeah, um, limits and effects. I mean, uh, because it, as you can imagine, uh, when you have various regulations uh, from various states that uh, are going to affect how you're able to uh, essentially practice whatever you're trying to promulgate, you know, whatever you're trying to do, it's, it's going to cause you to have so many rules that you have to touch on each and every state. Um, it's going to limit your innovation and what you can do. And so. Uh, let's let's do discuss and tell me what do you think, um, and maybe discuss how that regulation uh, mirrors the previous effects uh, uh, to, to regulate other technological innovations. Sure. So when I was in law school, uh, internet regulation was just beginning, and things like sales tax on the internet, uh, other forms of commercial enterprises where the state had an interest um, in either regulating people's behavior. Potentially illegal conduct, or in collecting some kind of revenue, uh, for example, Amazon.com. So what you saw was different states approaching the topic of you know state, state sales tax, for example, with varying approaches. Some would give sort of like a three-year window. The others, like we talked about, once Amazon comes in and sets up brick and mortar, the clock is ticking and the sales tax is going to start affecting those residents. So what it results in then is businesses cherry picking which states they move into, states that have the best economic outlook. But that's an old concept, right? Go where the taxes are lowest, you can go to Delaware, and incorporate all those kind of things. What's more concerning with daily fantasy sports and whether it's gambling or not, is you have states trying to set up parameters of enforcement. And depending on how each state views daily fantasy sports, whether or not it's gambling, whether or not it should or can be regulated, becomes sort of a technological nightmare. So 
So the point where it starts to limit innovation then is because the industry now has to respond in a quick turnaround manner. So I'm going to say the minute the Olympic fantasy sports need to be regulated, you have 60 days to comply. Well, that means they're on the clock with very technologically convoluted changes, geofencing, uh, different kinds of uh, things. <coughs> Part of it mirrors, uh, the idea was, look at internet gambling over time. You know, people used to gamble in the United States. Where, were, where was the transaction happening? Offshore somewhere. And how did they regulate it? The banking system. The banks would stop the credit card transactions. So now you're seeing the leading uh, providers saying we're stopping accepting credit card payments uh, from those states, the citizens of the states. So it mirrors, it's, it's literally taking the same path, but you don't really hear about offshore internet gambling anymore. Like it, it kind of runs its course, and the industry finds a better, uh, perhaps more uh, tolerable way to run this kind of thing. Jimmy, do you have any regulating ideas? Is there a consumer protection angle here as well? Is that why states, why the attorney general typically is the one leading the charge? So from my standpoint, I have to admit, on the litigation side and on the regulatory side, where most of this magic happens, I'm about some transactional lawyer, a deal lawyer, I look at how we can do deals in this space, find opportunities for money, put these companies together, tear something down, create advertising revenue, and do a deal. But from a regulatory standpoint, that's often what a state's regulator is looking at. Why am not I not getting my piece of the pie? Every state's Department of Revenue wants more revenue. So if I can't tax you, if I can't regulate you, I can't get my piece of the pie and guarantee that I'm getting all that I'm supposed to get. So that's why each state is involved. Now from a consumer protection standpoint, there are some potential consumer harms here. Um, one being unregulated or unrestricted employee use of data that these companies collect and then playing in another fantasy, in another fantasy, you know, like companies, you know, game, game. It just, uh, it doesn't, and I guess I'll, I'll use a concrete example. If I have numbers on ownership percentages, and I know that Philip Rivers is owned by 100 people, Eli Manning is owned by 1,000 people, I know that because I work with the company. If I take Philip Rivers, who's only owned by 100 people, if he performs the same as Eli Manning performs, I'm gonna get a bigger check at the end of the day. And that's a consumer protection issue because the people winning are the people with behind the scenes information. I want to regulate that to make sure my consumers are playing in an industry that's fair. And he mentioned some things to me about the way they advertise that, that you know, that are perceptive in terms of what the consumer might think the consumer is partaking in and what's actually going on. Let's put it here, Scars. Yeah, I was also going to say, I, you know, in the situations in Nevada and New York, it'd be hard to not imagine that part of the reason that they eliminated the use of daily fantasy sports is they want to control it or they want to get the revenue from it. Especially in Nevada. I think Nevada, of all the states, of the ones that have the most expertise of what is gambling and what is not gambling, you think Nevada would know that. And I think it's because they want a piece of that action. Um, which is probably a bad um, As far as the, the regulation aspect and the advertising, I think that's one of the things that gets me probably the most fired up is what they're, how they're advertising, how much they're advertising what they're saying during those advertisements because essentially they're selling us the lottery. They're putting that guy up there that looks like us and says, I won $800,000 last week by putting in $10. And the truth is, the guys that win at Daily Fantasy Sports, they're essentially day traders. They enter thousands of lineups a day to win hundreds of thousands of dollars. They're not someone who just, there might be a chance, a very small chance you enter just one $10 lineup and win hundreds of thousands of dollars. So from a consumer protection aspect, I don't think they're selling, I think they're selling the false bill of goods. So, so it sounds to me <clears throat> like your issue is, is, yes, the industry needs to be regulated, but we need to probably have stronger regulations on the actual advertising. I think so, and I think since what we saw happen in New York, not so much so like when that December ruling came out, New York said we're not gonna allow this anymore, we've seen the advertisements go down. They're still around, and they're still advertising, and they're already, uh, been advertising for different sports, but they're not at the same level they were during the, 
football season for sure. Yeah. Shane, too, if you look at the college sports angle to this, think about uh, <coughs> EA Sports, right? They stopped making the college game. They, their public response, uh, public relations response from them was, there is too much legal uncertainty right now to continue in this market, right, with Oban and with all those things. That same legal uncertainty could be, could undo the potential of daily fantasy. <coughs> are attempting to find a way to regulate it as opposed to shut it down. Why shut off a revenue stream? That doesn't make any sense. Gambling is occurring, perhaps, in the state anyways. Why not just find a way to make it a safe game that's fair to the consumers in the state? Yeah, I think that, I think the general view of gambling, whether it means sports gambling, has changed in the last 18 months. I think whether it's daily fantasy sports or not, even from the commissioner of the NBA coming out with some of favorable of gambling, I think in a hockey team potentially moving to Las Vegas, I think generally the sentiment towards isn't as negative as it has been in the past for sports gambling. I think that factors into the context of this conversation that people are becoming more understanding of sports gambling as not just a revenue source for the state, which every state is dying for money, but also as maybe not the seedy, scary behavior that we once saw. When all of our first world country sisters and brothers, uh, you can go to Australia and the UK and you can go bet in the stadium at halftime. And these are countries that we look to as being similar societies. We just have a stronger hold, a stronger belief of what sports gambling is. And let's, and let's again, make sure that we're separating that uh, through federal regulation, uh, daily, daily fantasy sports and fantasy sports are not considered gambling. And so it begs to ask the question then, why not? Right, and why then would states have such a strong advocacy against gambling, but yet such a strong advocacy towards fantasy sports or daily fantasy sports? But then you'd like to address that. And I think the answer is rather rhetorical and obvious that we've been discussing it, but yeah. let's, let's parse it out. Well, it's a difficult, a difficult answer. I mean, you can, you can talk to someone who doesn't know anything about sports and explain the premise of fantasy sports and say, you're putting money on you know, the outcomes of something that you have zero control of. And it sounds like gambling. Like you have zero control of what's gonna happen. If you hope to get money in return, it sounds like gambling. Um, but there's a lot of factors that factor, that factor into this, especially traditional. I mean, as we were talking about earlier, the reason traditional fantasy sports the season long has not been considered gambling is because, one, you know, you put down money in August, let's say a traditional football league, how many hardcore gamblers are gonna put down $100 in August wait till January to get paid. That isn't a behavior that most gamblers are gonna, that are hardcore gamblers are gonna want to pursue. They want their money instantly. Um, there's also a level of that, the chance skill debate that comes in, um, which is even more convoluted, but there's a belief over the course of an entire season that it's, enough, that it's more skill than it is chance. Um, daily is, has money that water because it does have, money does change hands so quickly. Um, I'm not sure completely. I, I, I'm not 100%. Do I know why they got the car about 2006? Because like you can make the argument either way. I know that the NFL will need to lobby hard to get it. Um, and I think, you know, from the research that I've done, it's a very pro social behavior, which I think is one of the things it has going for it. Um, so many other quote unquote dangerous gambling, the, pokers, the lotteries, the things that people can lose lots of money quickly that we view as being problem gambling is an antisocial activity. People separate themselves from their family, from their loved ones, and they do it in their darkness. But fantasy football is a pro-social behavior. And uh, it's about playing with your friends, your co colleagues, your coworkers. There are some nasty conversations that go on along with it, but it's still a, a family-oriented activity. So I think that plays a role, a somewhat of a role. I don't think it's before a I was thinking maybe, is there an analogy with ticket scalping, right? Ticket scalping laws have been on the books, but they're antiquated and often not enforced. And then the industry changes, and now you have StubHub, and you have a whole legitimate third party way to buy and sell tickets. And then the teams start to embrace it, they have ticket exchange. So does technology sort of, you know, soothe the wounds? In other words, ticket scalping as a negative behavior, now it's sort of just trading and exchanging market, um, where the law fits in, the law almost gets squeezed out of the debate. So it's a little bit ironic that 
daily fantasy is undergoing this state by state severe regulatory approach when every other way that technology has approved the experience, let's say, to sort of let the, the business go ahead and the law kind of steps steps aside. Is that fair or not a fair analogy? Well, I, so it, it sounds that the, the tail's like a dog a little bit, right? I mean, the, the regulations have been put out there and, and people know the rules yet as innovation occurs, then we sort of forget what's there, what's in place. And then with that innovation and the money that comes from that innovation, the, the major uh, sports organizations embrace it. They see the ability to uh, capture the monetary value of it and then they lobby to prevent anything from stopping it. So, I mean, that's what I'm hearing, Jimmy. I'd like to know your thoughts then. Uh, and, and we'll talk, and I appreciate you bringing up the research aspects. We'd like to talk about where the research and what the research might be able to do to help policymakers. Um, but Jimmy, with the NFL embracing draft teams, I believe, and uh, the NBA, um, they have a, they, they also recently signed a deal. They, uh, I'm sorry, Adam Silver came out and supports open sports gambling. What are your thoughts on uh, the implication of that to the leagues and how that can affect? or could uh, affect consumers, right? The products and whether that's gonna bring about more interest. Uh, maybe talk about that at the professional level, then college level and then high school level we discussed earlier. So I guess let me see. Who plays a lot of fantasy sports? Okay. Raise hands high, I like I'm kind of yeah. I'm that guy. Okay. Um, so who watches a lot of sports? And of the people who watch a lot of sports, have you ever like been looking for kind of sports commentary and seeing those fantasy guys up there and you're like wanting to know what's gonna happen between a real game and those fantasy guys are there and you're like, hey guys, there, there is a game that's gonna go on. Like uh, I know that this person's expected to get that many points, but I kind of want to know who's squaring off. And I think fantasy is almost growing to the point of being as important as the game. And what I'd love to see is us capitalize on that in more ways. And I think that could turn the, could stem the tide of the gambling talk if we really corral this thing. What I mean is that, you know, the fantasy sports are trickling down. And college, you know, what we're, what's really important here, college sports can really benefit from that if we can control it and make sure that we educate the populace about how it benefits college sports. Um, a lot of people struggle to watch college sports because there, there's so many games, so many sports, so many activities. But if you one sport I can see really benefiting from more fantasy, college baseball. I, are there any avid college baseball fans in here? Much, much fewer hands than the first two questions. But how many fantasy fans would think more about college baseball if you could get the same type of enthusiasm around building a college baseball team? You might learn some names of players. You might enter in because you're like, hey, it's not as many people playing here. There might be some opportunity. This is a bit of a new market. And it can get you more involved in the sport. It can bring the university more revenue to a sport that might be losing money and create a different <coughs> opportunity um, for maybe programs that were going to die. And where I, where I kind of push this that other people may not go, I think about maybe even, you know, like PTA associations and high school football and baseball and basketball and soccer teams that are dying. These programs that we see collapsing in our local schools. What if we could kind of create a little bit of energy and have like the different schools and students educated about this and play? and know that most of the money is going to keeping our schools programs there, but the winner still wins a little something at the end, maybe 50% while the other 50% of the pot goes to the sporting programs in those local areas. So I see huge implications on the positive side, but on the negative side, I see kind of a loss of what we view as the game to what we see as fantasy sports and it becoming the big thing. I know some people actually want to hurt people who don't perform well on their fantasy teams. Um, I've, I've had some, so Che and I represent athletes, and we've had some people come to us and say, do you know I got cursed out at the grocery store <laughs> because I didn't have a good day in fantasy? 
So I think there's a bit of anti-social to mix with our social because we're making our athletes commodities in a, in a sense. And I think we have to maybe do a little bit of work there to get people to know you can't walk up to this guy, you don't really own him. But too, you're, you're trying to change the social acceptance of online behavior of all kinds, right? Uh, the Atlanta Hawks uh, last season had a Tinder night, right, where you can meet, meet someone on Tinder at the game. So who's, who's deciding that? The marketing person, right? The marketing team. You know the risks of that? I mean, you meet some crazy person and they, you know, chop you up to pieces and you sue the Atlanta Hawks, rightfully so. Right. You know what? Right. Yeah. You're. you're I mean, saying your Tinder night backfired. The idea is, though, it becomes more socially acceptable, right? And you start to have a conversation where daily fantasy sports sounds like a lot more fun than internet gambling. It sounds like a lot more social behavior. So let's go to Tinder night at the Hawks. Reaches out to a certain demographic of people. They go. They love it, and they love it so much they had it again this season. They had it a second time. So obviously it worked. But the legal ramifications or legal consequences are innumerable. And, and I think that brings up a good point. It, it, it's interesting that the one I'll show back to that is I, as a lawyer, you see an immense amount of risk associated with it. And only, only a lawyer would go to the, next, the darkest place. <laughs> Everyone else thinks Everyone it's else a good Everyone else thinks love and tender. Right. Um, so let's, let's think about from a, from a research standpoint. Let's transition from the legal side. Um, how can the research, how do you think the research can help policymakers and inform consumers of that? It's uh, a good question. Uh, and this is a research conference, so that's part of the reason I'm sitting while I'm, I'm up here. Uh, but I've been doing research, I started almost a decade ago doing research on traditional fantasy sports. It hasn't been until recently that I've been doing daily fantasy sports, and that just it's in the headlines all the time. But I do think specifically how it relates. I do consumer behavior, I do fan behavior, so I love talking to people, interviewing people, surveying people, finding out what they believe, how they think, the perceptions of the, of the um, activity, and I'll also be the consumption, which is what you were talking about. I think there's no doubt that fantasy sports leads to more consumption of the NFL, Major League Baseball, whatever it is. The more teams you own, the more players you own, the more interest you have, there's a direct, um, positive relationship between that. Um, but, Specifically as it relates to perceptions versus chance of skill. That's one of the great debates about the legality of daily fantasy sports. Is it a game of skill or a game of chance? Um, and I've, over the course of this football season in 2015, I've done three or four studies specifically on chance and skill. Hope to provide that information. It may take two years to go through peer review process, but um, to talk about you know, what these fans think these participants think, is this a game of chance or a game of skill? Because they're the ones out there doing it all the time. Um, and they have a belief, and I think it's important because it's not just, it can't just be a computer generated model that says it's a game of skill or it's a game of chance. You have to talk to people. You have to talk to the consumers and see what they think because at some point they have a belief in, in their chances of winning. So uh, I think that in particular, the chance versus skill or luck versus skill debate can be solved through research. And would you say then that, to me back up to that statement, would you say that the skill uh, is, the, the skill required to increase or decrease as you get towards daily fantasy versus traditional fantasy? That's one of the hard things to measure because, I mean, I would say, and anecdotally would say there's more chance involved in daily than there is in, in traditional, but the guys that are winning the most amount of money are obviously very skilled at winning because small percentage of them that are winning all the money. So there's obviously a skill involved too. But I think from a chance factor perspective, the fact that, you know, if we're playing in a league and it's uh, the four of us in the league, one of us is gonna win, chances are if it's over the course of the season, the most talented team or the best run team is gonna win. If it's one day, the chance of the best team winning decreases because there's more luck factors. One of your games will get rained out. There could be bad weather, there could be your best player to get hurt. Uh, your quarterback you didn't have to sit up for a quarter, you never know. And so that that skill factor decreases and the chance factor increases. What is, no one ever seems to talk about with the chance to skill ratio is the fact that these tournaments on uh, FanDuel and DraftKings that have thousands and thousands of participants, there's game theory that goes involved too. I mean, 
it's not, you're not just competing against the four of us, but one of the four of us, we're competing against a thousand of us. And a thousand, maybe 500, like one person may have four or 500 lineups. And that differences in the lineups are a huge aspect of who wins. So to me, there's less, for the average consumer, there's much less, um, there's much less skill involved in daily. But for the ones that are winning all the money, like, there's a lot of skill. That's one of the hard parts about this debate. You guys share the same sentiment? Gentlemen, do you all share the same sentiment? Um, so for me, it's just really interesting because I want to know what skill is being tested. Um, is my analytical ability being tested? My ability to statistically analyze how many different lineups I can come up with on a computer and submit? Or is it really knowing who the best players are? And I think once we kind of like say we want to know who's the best at picking the best players, then we can think more about regulation and game rules. You can only put in this many lineups. You have to select your players in X amount of time, in X way, and try to prevent the algorithm from selecting players. I guess, I think it is a game of skill at this point, but I think the skill being tested is your your analytic skill and your counting on most people putting in bids without doing the, the actual statistical analysis. Um, so we can kind of tell who's winning most of them. But to piggyback on that, where the New York Attorney General employee have the confidential information so they're starting to act on it, right? Now it says, well, skill, obviously, if you have the right information, your skill level is increasing, and it's letting you win. So then they said, well, now we need to regulate an unfair or um, the competition is not exactly on the up and up. Certain people have more knowledge than others. So it, what it took, it's like a cottage industry, and said, well, now this got really sophisticated really fast, and now they have these similar problems about almost like insider trading type of thing. And so it seems that if we can somehow, and, and I'm just, again, taking what you all said and trying to uh, say it more fashion, but if we can regulate the inputs, right, and how many people uh, can play on a certain day or how quickly you can pick or uh, how, how many times you can enter in various leagues, etc., then maybe, maybe then we can control it enough to say that it is a deep skill. But right now, the argument, it's kind of that, that balanced scale, but, but you seem to have an ability to say this is, this, is, this is not necessarily a skill because you have so many factors that make it not necessarily a skill. Um, well, I think it's too much of a skill. I guess it's, it's pushing it the other way. I think that some people are really, really good at it, but the populace does not know that. The populace assumes that I'm playing against my friends. When you're really playing against someone in a room with computers who has already played this out in 10 different ways, who is going to win your money. Um, and I think maybe if we have a little bit more control over, over the league, I want them to have the same problem with the computers that my Titans have, trading out picks. <laughs> <laughs> and that goes towards what Dr. Pryor said about Regulating, if you can regulate the advertising a bit, right? I mean, we need to be educated on the fact that DraftKings is not something that one of us can go to and win a million dollars off of playing one lineup. Maybe, but your your chances of winning the lottery are about the same. Yeah, yeah I, I probably said statements make me sound like an anti-daily fantasy sports. And I am not. I have no problem on anyone, how anyone wants to spend their money. I just want them to be an informed consumer. I want them to understand that there are risks associated that, with that. And I think in particular for the 18 to 24 year olds, when we see them in this room, you know, research suggests you guys are the ones that have the hardest time regulating your consumption, whether that be alcohol consumption or any other consumption. But um, when it comes to the other fantasy sports, you're still the most at risk population. You're, uh, that is the group that I think needs to be the most informed about the risks associated with daily fantasy sports. If you understand the risks, you understand who you're competing against. Because they do have some games, not, not all the games are tournaments. Some of them are 50-50s. They have new competitions where your chances of winning are a little better. But if you're expecting to be that person on television that wins 
Uh, as my colleague says, it's the same chance of you getting attacked by a grizzly bear and a polar bear the same day. So we have a lot of money playing fantasy sports. Anyone? Anyone won a lot of money playing? But a lot of people in here have played. Um, anyone take a more analytical, statistical approach to playing? Anyone in here, the person who puts the, so Austin, you do that? Do you have more success doing that than just playing? Is your sport baseball or football? Football. It's like other baseball guys because it's every single day. Like they have some serious algorithms with pitching stats and whether whether the wind's blowing in or frequently or not. Like it's pretty serious, the baseball guys. So it's interesting. Very interesting. So then let's and then we're gonna leave a little bit of time. How much time do we have left? Okay, so we're going to leave a little bit of time for questions. So um, I, I think we touched on how this uh, affects professional and college sports, but let's let's end with the conversation regarding how this could impact NCAA uh, and how it <coughs> will or could impact college athletes. Um, I mean, again, we, we touched on it a bit, but to any of you panelists, let's, let's... Yeah, I'll give you a good example. When they had the um, fantasy sports, when they started the name name, so CBSSports.com named names, and that was a big watershed moment because no other uh, fantasy sports uh, platform had used the college athletes' names. They went to the NCAA and they said, are you going to fight this and protect the athletes? And the answer from the NCAA was very matter of fact. And it said, well, the college athletes' names and the data seems to be in the public domain. They cited a case involving professional sports where professional athletes totally have those rights, and college athletes don't at all have those rights. And they said, so we don't feel the need to wade into these waters. So it seems as if they take that approach, they may say, well, the states can regulate as they wish, and we'll kind of stand on the sidelines. But where does that, again, leave the college athlete who feels left out of the profit pie that is you know, exploding every day, getting bigger and bigger? The pie keeps getting bigger, the athletes piece of that pie is still uh, no bigger if it's no pie. Yeah, I'm interested. I'd like to hear Jimmy's thoughts on this too, because you have more of the, it sounds more the entrepreneurial view on this. But I mean, DI, uh, the two DFS agreed, the two DFS companies agreed in the end of March to no longer do college daily fantasy sports. I don't know how long that'll last. I think they're waiting for other states, and they're waiting for some federal legislation. Their reasoning behind it, why the NCAA is against it, is because they don't believe that daily fantasy sports should be involved in amateur athletes, which, um, I mean, high school level, youth level, you name it. But there does seem to be a market, and it's not unlike the NCAA to not be involved when there is some sort of market. The question is, how could they actually leverage this so that it could get back to the athletes without making it, making the rule book that's already this big, making it as tall as the ceiling? But I'd be interested in your thoughts on other ways they probably could leverage it to get it back to the athletes. So I'll preface this by saying I'm a pay for play, um, allow everyone to make money person, um, or allow everyone to play whatever sport at whatever age the populace wants to see that person playing. I could see Justin Bieber at any age. He could perform anywhere if he didn't need to be protected. I don't think athletes need to be protected from earning a living as professionals. Because there are rules that prevent them from earning that living, and because often they do have to step on college campuses and play sports, I think that when money is made, they should be provided that money and the powers that we should figure out how to make that happen in a way that you know squares with their problems and what they can afford to pay, um, what they can afford to dish out in terms of revenue to revenue making individuals. Um, and not just individuals, but teams. And obviously there's some level of sharing that has to go on. The best player can't get all the money with everyone else not getting anything. Um, I'll leave that to people far smarter than I am to figure out how that's done, but that's where I fall on that side. So with the fantasy sports, I say bring it to college sports as well. Use the names, use everything. and 
if it makes money, if the schools are able to go out and get additional advertising, are able to you know, work with these leads even individually and sign small deals where those things go toward scholarships and you, you can tie that money to someone's scholarship. I mean, we find ways to watch money anyway. Um, figure out how to do that and say, look, you're actually funded in part by DraftKings or by FanDuel, so you have been paid and you still don't have to cut them a check. Um, we can figure out ways to do it, or we can actually cut them a check, which I would like. Um, I also, you know, just uh, believe that we can always find a solution. Um, we just kind of want to make sure that we don't push this pay-for-play argument any further. So anything that borders on that, everyone's willing to just let let go. If it's video games, if it's sports, if it's whatever, because fantasy is heavily involved. <coughs> regular video games, if you play action adventure games, there's a ton of fantasy betting on the individuals playing in those games, and some of them are 12 year old kids. Those are amateur everythings, um, and we don't stop that. Uh, the idea too though is, you know, just last week or this week, the NCAA said college athletes can have endorsements, they're moving, or they're moving toward that model, right? So it seems like they realize that the need for better opportunities Exist, it's now finding the right solution, as you say. Uh, the other part, too, is you know you could kind of avoid the pay for play argument and say, again, you're being compensated in a marketing way for the use of your name and your likeness in, in the game and selling that. To the person on the front of the EA Sports always gets more money, use it more of that angle. You're not being compensated for your playing, you're being compensated for the It's a little bit of this, you know, stats because you know, the public domain and all that. But the idea is the NCAA seems to at least have opened the door a bit more. Now. Uh, but that CBC thing, that, that was just like, why didn't they say anything? They just kind of put up their hands and said, this isn't our fight to fight. So maybe they do realize that there needs to be a little bit more of a balance approach. Great, great answers and great responses. Um, we, could, we could go on. I want to leave a little bit of time uh, for questions if we have any. Um, and to that extent, I guess, also, if you could, if, is that a movable microphone? Just so we could hear folks. And uh, to say that people have questions, um, could you raise your hand? A player who underperformed so that the gamblers in Las Vegas could make money. It was a tragic situation. People's lives were destroyed. And I'm not so sure fantasy sports can't be fixed. Uh, with all these hackers and all this kind of stuff, um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little concerned about that. And I think some of the people that suffer because uh, it does have some addictive qualities. You know and I know if people are addicted to gambling, they're putting food on the table for the kids, they're out losing their, their homes and everything else. That's a little exaggerated, but the point is, I don't think we've looked at all the picture in a clear way. I think it has a purpose. It has an entertainment purpose, but I think uh, there's there's things we haven't seen that I'm a little concerned about as a sport here. So, so I'll, we we discussed this a bit. Which one of you wants to pick first out? So, so my my client, um, one of my clients is the CEO of Fantasy Sports Company. And his counter to that is for the, I'll, I'll deal with the fixing element first. Fantasy is much harder to fix because you can't have any single player try to tank or any single team try to tank and kind of mess up the whole competition. Because of the way it's structured, it's so spread out, there's so many different ways you can pick. So even if someone were, you know, for example, if, it, if someone's tanking, you believe that? It would have to be someone taking in the Big Ten, the SEC, everywhere else, and in order to have a real effect on the outcome of that particular competition that day, because it's so spread out. That's his count. Um, now to the element of the addictive behavior, I think that's a problem with gambling, that's a problem with the stock market, that's a problem with so many things. 
that we would have to tackle everything to not be hypocritical and just tackling fantasy. Yeah, and I can speak to some research. We have research that we just did a study, we just wrapped up, it hasn't been published yet, but there was a population, 16% of our population, that cognitively their dispositions were toward big problem gamblers. The amount of money, the amount of time, and the other attitudinal factors that we looked at, looked at it was addictive based behavior that it is worrisome. It's a small percent, it's only 16%, but that's one of the reasons why sports gambling and gambling in our, in our country is so heavily regulated, is to protect that. The problem is, is you know, any sort of addiction is such a difficult battle and it can come in so many different forms. If it's not gambling, what else could it be? So it's hard just to say this is a sports gambling or a fantasy issue, it could be a broader issue, but there is research, but we do have research to show that at least a small, portion of this population do are showing signs of problem gambling. But that also uh, Bob raises the government interest in regulating uh, or protecting the consumers, or even from themselves. Right? If you're gambling and think you're gambling in a fair system where you're playing with your neighbors, but in reality you're playing with professional gamblers who are just robbing you every day, you don't see that. There is a government interest, a state interest in protecting the consumers bad choices. Uh, South Carolina has a long history with you know, video poker where you pull off any, any uh, quick mark, whatever they have with video poker, and they had to regulate that out of the state. Thank you. Good responses. Uh, in the back, you see here. Uh, FPS is $6 billion a year in revenue, D1 is $10 billion, and college gambling is $60 billion, right? Approximately. Okay. So, I mean, if, if you got 60 billion already being bet legally, at least in four states, on college sports, how th this is a minor issue. If that's what you care about, this is an irrelevant issue. There's real money out there being played, and nobody even knows how to trace where that money comes back into the system. And I'm sure it does. Yeah. The only thing I would, I mean. The only thing that's different is they don't have advertisements on television every 13 seconds saying, come gamble at my site. Um, I'm sure it happens. I know it's in dollar figures. You're talking about a lot of money, the big scheme of things. But um, it's different to have that be going on as opposed to trying to advertise to get people to do it as trying to say it's a different activity than the risky behavior that it could be. So um, I do think it may be small potatoes. Um, but I think it's because it is viewed as legal and harmless and a family-run activity, that's why more states and the federal level is getting involved, because they want to make sure that they should try to regulate it if they have to, because right now it's currently unregulated. And one funny thing to me, um, when we start talking about money, and, and I, I didn't really know this from an industry perspective, but my client told me that Everyone talks about the smaller companies not really being profitable because of the bigger companies. They told me that the bigger companies are not profitable either. It's just that they have so many users, they can keep the venture capitalists coming to the table. So those are the people really gambling it. Um, they're gambling on the fact that laws are going to get passed correctly, on the fact, or going to get passed in their favor, that we're going to continue playing, that nothing else will replace this that people won't just become gamblers. Yeah, and those venture capitalists are ESPN, CBS, the NFL, the NBA, those are the ones that are putting up most of the money. They have the equity stake in all these companies. Great, great responses. Right, another question? Any other questions? All right, last chance, comments? Yeah. All right, go ahead. I've, I've coached football for the last 26 years, and well, I think baseball, is. there's always going to be the rotisserie leagues. There's some type of individualized deal in that. Football, to me, has always been the most interdependent sport in the world that there is. But around 2000, you said it, Jimmy, around 2000, now we're no longer rooting for teams. We're rooting for people. And over the last... Since then, I was calling plays in the NFL in 2000, and since then, the game has changed and is a play call. 
You, I don't know everything, but you're aware of it. In the grocery store, at traffic lights, at restaurants, my dad's called me and asked me why I've been handed the ball off in the red zone. He was playing that. <laughs> it affects everything, and I'm a purist as well. The most interdependent sport in the world is kind of being torn apart by this. I mean, I grew up outside Pittsburgh. I could no more root for Roger Staubach growing up than the man on the moon. But now, if you live in Pittsburgh, you can sure as heck root for Tony Romo if you're playing. The team element, the most interdependent sport in the game, is losing a real element uh, because of this. And I'm telling you, as a play caller, it's affected me. As a coach, it's affected our team. Players know. Players know. In that, Jimmy, you just said make a comment. I'm making a comment, I reckon. That's sad to me. It's sad. That's a great comment. I can speak. That's why I got into studying a lot of fantasy football. And that was more of a visual sense because I used to coach too. Um, I coached at the Division One level, and you know, I know that the players and the coaches it must drive them crazy to see a game like football being have to ask questions about the fantasy implications of their decisions when they're there to win the game. I still think that's something that the fantasy industry and in the NFL professional sports can think about in the long term sense how fantasy will undermine the premise of the most important outcome of a team winning a game because it's getting to that point. Really is. It's been a huge brand building success for the NFL and the NBA, and they're rolling in money because of it. But it does undermine the general purpose and the most important aspect of these games, and that is for a team to win a championship. Because they have to deal with all these ancillary issues associated with um, the questions, these meeting in the grocery stores, stoplights, all these things. It happens. It really does. I, I couldn't agree more. Great, great. Any last, last opportunity for comment? Thank you for the comment. Comments or questions? All right, well, I'll pass the call. Thank you. I'll give a last round of applause for our